So welcome everyone. And we're looking at the work of Gauguin. We were looking at this work at the end last week, one of his self-portraits, very dra dramatizing self-portraits. We looked already at the various different influences on Gauguin's art. I portrayed him as an artist with several different sources that he turned to, you know, Pizarro, uh, Degas, Cezanne, and the Japanese print. Quite an e eclectic artist. I tried to show something about the development of his mature style, a post-impression style. We spent quite a lot of time looking at his vision after the sermon, for instance, and saw that transformation of his art. It's maybe not just about purely stylistic issues. Maybe there are issues of content, of meaning, that also played a part in that transition. I spent time comparing him, him to Van Gogh and Bernard, the artists that he had a, a dialogue with, just at the beginning of his mature phase, uh, I'll talk a bit more about his time in Brittany now, uh, and then I'll talk about his late work produced in uh, Tahiti. So, yeah, I mean, this is already a kind of well, placing himself between a Peruvian pot on the one hand, some kind of sort of primitive uh, association there, and Chris, a Christian image of a crucifixion on the other, drawn from his own painting, the, the Yellow Christ, on the other side. It's almost putting himself between two polarities. Remember that he ha his mother was half Peruvian, so that he, the, the, sense, the sense of the exotic is something which he feels is part of him, you know, he's putting his, he, it's somehow his identity is split between two different things. Perhaps that's part of what the, the meaning is here. But also seeing himself in relation to uh, a religious figure, that's almost like a, a self-aggrandizing image of himself as an outsider figure in the same way that in the Christian story, Christ was this sort of reviled figure who was, was killed, you know. Uh, on, in, the, in the story of the crucifixion. Um, this is very different place in society for an artist from the time of, say, David, you know, an artist at the center of society playing important public roles. Here now we come to a sort of characteristic modern role of the artist as something to the edges of society. In his own time, like Van Gogh, Gauguin is not highly respected as an artist. It's only later he's come to have uh, a role in the art history textbooks and to see his works on the wall of museums. So very much in his own lifetime, he's an outsider. And art itself, or the challenging edge of art, is on the outside of things at this point in time. The role of the artist is not um, central to modern society in that sense. But um, funnily enough, a thing that goes along with that is the artist's claim for greater importance. Almost uh, the artist becomes like a, a seer, a, a, a figure of religious uh, significance, a, a prophet-like figure, hence this sort of self-aggrandizement in a self-portrait or, you know, he, he talking about uh, almost a sort of religious role for art. As art becomes socially marginalized, it, it becomes greater in its sense of the importance of its role. Uh, so Gauguin says, for instance, the only way to rise towards God is to do as our divine master does, create. You know, if you are an artist, if you create things, you are somehow participating in the creation of the universe. You're being godlike, or you're coming close to God in through your creativity, because that's what God did to cre create the world. So you are sort of somehow participating, reliving that process when you uh, engage in creativity. So it's, it's a sort of argument for the importance of creativity. Another self-portrait, uh, just to continue this uh, theme, an 1889 self-portrait. Well, it gives, an, it gives himself a halo, again, the sense of sort of religious importance. 
uh, but there's also a snake, which is often the signifier of the um, of the devil, the temp temptation in the Garden of Eden. And of course, the apples could also refer to that. So he's he's between the two. He's between uh, caught between these binaries. Not good, not bad, or, or tempted in in both ways. So very ambivalent, self, a very self-traumatizing self-portrait. One more self-portrait. Uh, well, it's a kind of self-portrait embedded within a larger theme. You could say, "Bonjour, Monsieur Gauguin." It's a, a scene of Brittany where he's having an encounter with a Breton peasant uh, woman. And the, the title, Bonjour, Monsieur Gauguin, Hello, Mr. Gauguin, 1889, uh, would immediately record to people the title of this work, a work by Courbet, Bonjour, Monsieur Courbet, Hello, Mr. Courbet. Uh, and this is a painting that Courbet painted when he went to the south of France to visit his patron, Bruyas. And you see the, the middle class patron in relationship to the artist and uh, greeting him as an equal or even in a slightly deferential way uh, to, towards the, the great artist, uh, very sort of egotistical <laughs> quality to it. Um, so you could say here's Gauguin revisiting the idea of the, the artist encountering uh, another, but instead of the, the bourgeoisie, he's encountering the peasantry. Um, and that's a whole different social situation. Uh, Gauguin would have seen this painting with Van Gogh, I believe, when he was in the south of France. It's in Montpellier. It's still there in the south of France, in the museum in Montpellier. So um, that's a work he would have known. He identifies quite a lot with the... Breton people and uh, he says I love Brittany I find wildness and primitiveness there when I walk along in my wooden shoes on the granite earth I hear the hollow powerful sound that I'm looking for in my painting so it's sort of mystificatory kind of, um, sort of treatment of his his time in uh, in Brittany his attitude to the Breton people I'd like to just go back just briefly to the theme that I mentioned before about the Breton language and the fact that people of this area have their own language, um, quite distinct from French. So that means the title of this painting makes, uh, makes it a rather specific moment, a moment where the Breton woman is actually using his language to him, coming out of, out of her language world into his language world, building a connection. So it's almost like a kind of opposite to the painting of four Breton women we looked at, uh, at the, almost at the beginning uh, last time, uh, where you had a sense of exclusion from their world, the four women uh, talking amongst themselves with their backs to us. Here, uh, oh, there is a, 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 uh, some kind of barrier, the gate, signifying a physical barrier, signifying a cultural barrier, if you like, or social barrier between Gauguin and the peasant women, but uh, there is communication across the barrier. She's speaking to him in his language. So he's, he's not exactly one of them, but he is somehow connected to them, seems to be what the, the painting is saying. And we know, you know, it's an unusual case. Normally you don't, you can't hear what someone is saying in a, in a painting, even if conversation is depicted. But uh, unless you have speech bubbles like in a cartoon, but here the title implies uh, speech, so uh, that we have a unusual kind of access into the world, the spoken world, it's word, the word of the spoken world of the spoken word. And just while we're on it, is another painting with a sim uh, also a kind of take on the Courbet painting. Uh, this is by the English artist Peter Blake. Um, so uh, he, he's picking up on um, Courbet's painting 
uh, the, 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 the title here, The Meeting, which is an alternate title of the Courbet painting. The Meeting, or Have a Nice Day, Mr. Hockney. So it shows Peter Blake and another artist, Howard Hodgkin, visiting two English artists, visiting the English artist David Hockney when he was living in California. So there's these sort of typical Californian leisure activities going on in the background. Now I want to say something about the influence of Gauguin during the period he was in Brittany, some other artists came to gather around him and really became, if you like, his disciples. Um, this is a painting which is often referred to as the Talisman, or the full title, The Landscape of the Bois d'Amour, 1888, painted by a relatively minor artist called Seruzier, who was one of those artists who gathered around Gauguin uh, in, in Brittany, in pont -Avon, becoming a sort of school of, of pont -Avon. And Seruzier had asked for advice for Gauguin, and Gauguin took him out into the landscape and made him produce this particular painting. It's a very small painting, um, just painted on the lid of a cigar box on a wooden panel. So he painted this up direct, under the direction of, of Gauguin. Um, according to the painter Maurice Denis, Gauguin's advice to Seruzier was, what do, what do those trees look like? You see them as yellow, very well, put on some yellow. And for the shadows, which look blue, if anything, paint it pure ultramarine. Those red leaves, Take some vermilion. So uh, the advice of Gauguin seems to have been to simplify form and to heighten color. Seruzier himself says, Gauguin insisted on a logical construction of composition, on a harmonious apportionment of light and dark colors, the simplification of forms and proportions, so as to endow the outlines of forms with a powerful and eloquent expression. So outlines become important. Outlines can't be powerful in a painting unless you simplify forms. You don't give, you know, less can be more. If you want one aspect of the painting to work strongly, you maybe have to reduce other things. So a multiplicity of different tones would weaken color. It would also weaken the power of outline. So simplification is not a giving up necessarily. It could be a concentration. So Seruzier took this painting, the talisman, which means like a sort of magic, powerful magic object, took it back to Paris, and it was seen there by many other artists, such as Maurice Denis. Maurice Denis, well, I'll show you. First, I'll show you an example of Seruzier's work when he's just, sort of, once he's absorbed the lessons of um, Gauguin. So this is his Breton Eve. So biblical scene placed in a Breton landscape. And here's Maurice Denis. Just a, a work chosen uh, at random almost of his, of his work. Maurice Denis is quite important because he's a bit of a, a theorist, so through him other artists get to know of Gauguin's idea. This is the process by which Gauguin's approach to painting comes to influence quite a number of different artists. So here's Maurice Denis talking about this. Sorusier's keen philosophical mind soon transformed Gauguin, Gauguin's slightest words into a scientific doctrine which made a decisive impression on us. We were presented for the first time with the fertile concept of a plain surface covered with colors assembled in a certain or order. Thus we learned that every work of art was a transposition, a caricature, the passionate equivalent of a sensation experienced. Art can never quite capture life. It's always going to have to distort it in some way. It can't can't, is transposing the richness of life into the flat world of the painting. It's producing an equivalent, as uh, according to Morrison, of a sensation, of a feeling. It's not about 
objective things anyway, just about them. It's also about feelings which can't be delineated, which don't have an outline. So it's through Maurice Denis these ideas become very well spread. You know, there's a particularly well-known statement by Maurice Denis from 1890. He says, it's well to remember that a picture before being a battle horse, a nude woman, or some anecdote, is essentially a plain surface covered with colors assembled in a certain order. Very famous uh, statement, actually. It's a sort of modernist uh, manifesto in, a, in itself. Uh, the idea that when we think of painting first, we should think about the forms and the colors, the, the, the stylistic element, the musical element, if you like, and only secondarily do we think of the content. It's a, it's a real shift, and that's a really how postmodernism and, and so much that comes after it is really different from earlier art. We, we, we think first and foremost uh, of the forms and colors. And of course, once you've done that, once you've come to say that the subject matter is secondary, uh, then you know it's only one further step before you can get to abstract art, where there is no subject matter. You don't need it. You know, if it forms and colors are an important thing, if they express feelings or provide a kind of aesthetic, aesthetic, aesthetic satisfaction in themselves, then why do you have to have subject matter at all? So a devaluation of subject matter. And so this, this kind of trajectory of influence, it goes all the way to an artist like Matisse, a much greater artist than Maurice Denis, most people would agree. Um, but it's hard to imagine Matisse's mature style without that of uh, Maurice Denis and, and, and of Gauguin before him. You know, when Matisse was in the south of France, he went to visit the work, a collector who had um, several works by Gauguin. So, you know, it's, it's all an important trajectory. So the final stage of Gauguin's life when he's in Tahiti. And in the very end of his life, he's also even further away from civilization in the Marquesas Islands, which, uh, you know, were less developed, less touched by, um, by Western influence. So he moves to Tahiti in, in 1891, and he spends the rest of his life there, basically, in the South Seas, apart from a visit back to Paris uh, in 1893 to 95. So it's from this time in Tahiti that we get this image of Gauguin as the artist escaping civilization, as a kind of outsider, a dropout, if you like, in, in modern terms. I am escaping the artificial, I am penetrating nature, he says. So some of his own con comments will help sustain this kind of myth uh, ab ab about him. He does some very uh, Im valuable works there, and he's particularly productive perhaps at first, although there are also, it has to be admitted, long stretches when he's not doing a great deal of painting. Um, He's suffering from disease. He's really unwell at certain points. He has a, a moment of feeling suicidal. So although in his work he shows, a, for the most part, a, a kind of tropical paradise, actually that's a, there's a disparity between that and his life. Um, he's not showing the reality of life in Tahiti, modern Tahiti as of his time in a direct way for the large part. You know, what it would have been would have been not so much just a tropical paradise, but a run-down French colony. You know, what he's not showing are the presence of the French, for instance. He's not showing the modern buildings in this, the, the city in the capital and, and the, uh, the, the, you know, the destruction of previous uh, traditional modes of life, which certainly has had uh, advanced um, quite far by that point in time. I mean, he had to learn a lot of what he learnt about Tahitian lifestyle by reading a book written by an anthropologist on a previous 
you know, of a generation before. This was a book from 1837 called uh, Voyage, Voyage au Ile de, du Grand Ocean by uh, someone called Murnenhout. So, uh, you know, he's learning from French books about Tahiti rather than from what's left around him. But as I say, for the most part, he's not showing that, although there, I think we will see there's some hints in his work about the complexity of life in a colonial situation that are allowed to come through. He's not just mystifying our image of Tahiti. Tahiti. And certainly he himself came to be quite anti-colonial in his a attitudes there, he, in his life there. He, he uh, got into arguments with the church there, for instance, and their attitude towards the, the locals. So some of the, the works from his early period are, are like this. It's almost like a still life primarily. Um, fairly naturalistic, but uh, he also produces works which are more uh, um, from the imagination. So this is the, the red dog, or Araya Araya. It shows a religious scene, but it's probably something he couldn't really have witnessed himself. Again, he's you know reliant on a, accounts of, of religion, and that the idol figure is a sort of hybrid, made-up figure from tiki figures and uh, even the Easter Island statues, which are uh, so famous. Uh, he would have seen some of these things in museums on his way, way on his way out there, for instance, and knew about them from books. So this is his mythic land of uh, when nobody seems to work. They just they engage in religious rituals, or they're sitting around making music. It's a kind of image of paradise, a, a sort of possible world of a sort of sensuous paradise. One 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 feels flat surface, very much emphasized flat areas of color, rhythmic, strong sense of outline, sense of calm. Maybe we do need, you know, utopian images aren't just a um, kind of hiding away from reality. Maybe we do need some image of a, a possible world of harmony to aspire towards. You know, maybe you can look at it more positively like, like that. He did some carvings um, while he was there. Um, this is a, a wood carving. You know, a lot of the actual art of, of the um, Pacific Islands is uh, 3D art rather than 2D art. A lot of carving. And that usually it's carving on utilitarian objects like the oar of a the paddle of a uh, of a canoe or something like that, or a year decoration, and a lot of their designs are very, very richly, decoratively um, full. You know, the, 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 there's not much empty space. Uh, so he's mimicking some of the, that style, and I suppose engaging with the, the medium of wood carving to, in order to have a dialogue with what bits of the, the native visual culture he can find. Uh, I'm sorry this is such a terrible slide because it's, it's made from black and white photocopy. So you see in the middle the same thing that I've just been showing you, this wooden pillar. Um, and then you're seeing the back view of it. And what you're seeing here is a uh, a war club from the Marquesas Island. Now this is a typical type of object, decorated object that you, you could find from that part of the world. Marquesas was the islands he moved to at the very end of his life. So not far from Tahiti, but further away. And you can see the same kind of very rich decoration, but even some specific motifs like this sort of sun form stylized sun form here is a little bit similar to what he's included here. And um, you know, this sort of double 
forms here, maybe a little bit like the double forms here. Um, but he's introduced Christian motif as well, a crucifixion scene. So he's, he's putting together native religious themes and uh, imported religious themes. Maybe it's a little bit of a reference to how the culture of that island had been affected by the arrival of the missionaries overlaying their Western culture over native culture, or putting them side by side, or maybe thinking about, you know, this is a, a club for, ki it's an, a, a tool for killing, you know, ritually killing or whatever. So here's a god being killed, you know, maybe the subject matter is sort of taken as um, important or uh, relevant to the objects he's looking at, or, you know, this is a Christian image on one side and then native idol images as he might have thought of it on the other side. We can only guess what he might have been thinking but anyway these are the, the where he could find native culture he, he did seem to to find it for instance there's one uh, landscape where he shows a, a fence in the landscape and the fence is represented there were no such fences but he represent the, fe the fence using uh, a design taken from an ear ornament. Tattoos he was interested in. Of course, that's another important part of the culture, visual culture of that region. Um, and he, he, you know, he shows an interest in that. The market. in very flat two-dimensional design, absence of modeling, absence of perspective really. Quite thinly painted, you're very aware of the, the weave of the, the canvas, aren't you? So uh, that's something quite often the case in uh, Gauguin's painting. Stylized flattening two dimensions, bright color. He, he, he says at one point uh, to a friend about the importance of looking to non-Western cultural sources. Here's our vision in crisis theme, our theme of you know, the, the, the encounter with other cultures and how that destabilizes the certainty about our own culture as offering the right way of looking at things. He says, have always before you the Persians, the Cambodians, and a little of the Egyptians. The great error is the Greek, however beautiful it may be. Actually, there are works by Gauguin where you can see him looking at Greek art, but sure, he's, uh, he's somehow destabilized the idea that Greece and Rome are the roots of our Western civilization, and we must always refer back to them and give them a privileged place. He wants us to look at other completely different civilizations and give them equal uh, merit. So in this particular case, perhaps the visual influences from Egyptian art, you know, these sort of stylized hand poses, for example, is something you might find in Egyptian wall painting, or the, the idea of having a face uh, looking in profile, then a body in, uh, you know, looking towards you, then the leg in profile, that's the sort of thing you'd see in Egyptian art. So quite eclectic, an artist who takes from many different cultural sources, and I think leaves those borrowings there in his work. You, you, you're aware of him looking at these different sources. The, 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 the influences aren't 100% absorbed into a unified style of his own. It's a, it, he, he's letting you see the traces of where they all come from. I think that's part of what you get. Ia Orana Maria or Ave Maria. Here I think he's been looking at Javanese art. If we think of these figures here with their, their, po their poses, it's a little bit close to the kind of figures you might see on the reliefs of Borobudur, great temple complex in, in Java, Buddhist complex. 
Goga, I believe, had some idea that the people of Tahiti maybe originally came from that part of the world. Maybe that's part of why he's, um, you know, choosing the art from that part of the world. That would be a logical connection you could make. And, and I believe that anthropologists and, and, you know, scientists in general have suggested that might in fact be the case. So again, it's a sign of his eclectic searching. And also, I suppose, of the, the absence of l a local visual idiom that he can just wholeheartedly engage with. They're, they're, you know, colonialism has destroyed so much. And you know, he's drawing on Javanese art, not Tahitian art. He's also drawing on Christian art. There's an angel here, which is related to Christian iconography. And we see a sort of Madonna and child with halos. It's a sort of transposition of a Christian scene into a native Tahitian setting, a little bit like the way with the yellow Christ that we ended on in last, last week, transposes a crucifixion to a Breton uh, setting. It's a little bit more complex than that even, because this makes us think of a Madonna and child, a mother with a child, which is a rather unusual pose for a Madonna and child, but still that's the association that comes up because of the halos and uh, Mary, Maria. Um, but um, the idea of the angel coming in, it's a little bit like an annunciation scene where the angel announces to uh, Mary, that she's going to become pregnant by God, give birth to Jesus. And this uh, white flower, bush with white flower, tree with white flowers, uh, that's very analogous to the lilies which are often shown in Annunciation <coughs> scenes to show the purity of the Virgin. So it's a mixture of two different Christian iconographies. It's a little bit strange in that way. So again, because the Christian elements are so obvious, it, it, it does give us a sense of it being a work where we see meetings of cultures, you know, that the reality of colonial life as being a place where cultures sort of clash and overlay one over the other, or you know, this is somehow laid bare in a work like this, where these different cultural sources are. We're very, very aware of them as present. As I say, he hasn't absorbed them into his own unified style. We, we, it is this eclectic quality, a mixing of different sources, local and not local. Another key element here is. The, the inscription of a title onto the painting itself. Well, we, we saw that already, for example, here, Are Are. That's quite small, but in this work it's bigger, and also it's picked out against a yellow background to make it more prominent. So somehow it, it's standing between us and the space of the painting. It's somehow partly blocking our access to the painting. I find that interesting. I mean, it, it, sometimes people would explain this as being a kind of exoticization of the, you know, the, the painting for his Parisian audience. Remember, these are works that will go back to Paris to sell. At least that's the idea. But I, I think I want to see it as somehow decentering that Parisian cosmopolitan subject and their sense of mastery over the world of this painting of uh, a colonial site. Uh, by putting something in front of their eyes that they can read, it's written in a Western writing, you know, the Tahitians didn't have their own writing system at that time. So you can try and read it, but then you find you can't actually make much sense of it. So maybe one word, oh, Maria, well, we know what that is, that's her name, Mary, the mother of God. But actually, we can't make sense of the whole of it. Um, so it, 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 you're confronted with otherness uh, that you can't quite master. 
so I think that's a, a kind of useful strategy that he uses, a little bit like this, the concern with Breton language in the earlier paintings, but here uh, I think it's a little bit more successful through the use of writing. Speech is also involved, you know, we greet thee Mary, is the title in English, and you know, that implies speech on behalf of the figures approaching Mary. So we, we, it's almost like we're hearing a language that we can't quite grasp. It's, it's another way of putting sound or spoken language into alien spoken language into the world of a, the silent world of a painting. Perhaps a bit more successfully than in the Breton world. Yeah, so here's just to remind you of the iconography of the an Annunciation. It's a work by Duccio. I could have chosen many other examples, just one at random. We'll see how white flowers are part of the iconography and figures coming in, angel coming in to announce what's going to happen. And here is a, an, an example of a little detail of the free, one of the friezes on a Borobudur temple complex, the kind of thing that uh, would have interested um, Gauguin. Well, he'd never been to Java, but so how does he know about all this? He knows about it because of um, seeing photos of it um, and because of the presentation of Javanese culture at the Universal Exhibition in Paris in 1889 where a lot of art from exotic places, art and culture from exotic places were was represented through. There was a uh, also a reconstruction of the Angkor Wat temple, or part of it, the, uh, the temple in Cambodia, and of a Javanese village. There were things there to represent those cultures, parts of the world where, which were French colonies at that point in time. So it's not just, uh, uh, well, sorry, Cambodia was. So it's not just random, the places that uh, he happens to show an interest in. And Buddhism, of course, was an interest to various people, not just artists at that point in time. The, the philosopher Schopenhauer, for instance, was quite interested in Buddhism. Whether they understood Buddhism is another question. They Maybe they interpreted it uh, through the lens of German idealist philosophy, for instance, maybe they saw Buddhism as sort of nihilistic or something like that, you know. But anyway, they were interested in it. The white horse. Well, here maybe even there's something of um, the reliefs of the the frieze of the Parthenon, uh, and now the Elgin marbles in London, I think that's one of the influences here. Putting complementary colors together, the orange and the blue, the red and the green, sinuous li linear, sorry, linear forms, very much a two-dimensional design first and foremost. I think that world he shows of great sort of calm and peace uh, is a little bit influenced by the the style of Puivi, Puivi de Chavin. Uh, Puivi is an interesting artist. He's a he's a an academic artist. For the most part, all the impressionists and post-impressionists are reacting against academic art. But there are one or two figures within the academic tradition that appeal to them more, and Puivi is one of those. Um, he gets to know some of the figures from the avant-garde and form a relationship to them. And Gauguin is one of those. So Matisse and Picasso in the early 20th century, they were also interested in the work of Puivi. He's most famous for his mural painting. And when you're painting a mural, often you want to be aware of the, the, the flat surface of the wall. Uh, so his paintings have this sort of two-dimensional quality. That's one thing that would appeal to him, uh, to, uh, to, to appeal to, to Gauguin about him. And 
also, I think this way in which she creates a world of harmony and calm, you know, that that's something that the that the the two artists share. So even when he's in Tahiti, he's bringing a lot of cultural influences with him from home. He's brought in his baggage, if you like, a lot of influences that he's going to use. Egyptian, ta um, Cambodian, Javanese, and pre de Java as well. Well, it's, this is another of the works where I feel there's a sense of the cultural contact coming through. The complex reality of colonial life is allowed to seep into the image. Conte's Barbar, bar, Barbaric Tales, you could say, 1902. Uh, it includes uh, a portrait of a, a white male figure along with the two <coughs> native women, Tahitian women. Uh, so it's one of the rare works where you see cultural meeting in Tahiti. Maya Dahan was an, an artist that Kogan um, knew. And the white male presence is shown in a slightly negative way as sort of looming behind the, the two native girls and even the way he's shown his bare feet almost like claws given him a slight sort of devilish presence. So here we maybe have some sort of sense of the Western culture as somehow intrusive into or predatory upon native culture. It's a little bit unstated, but I think that all that is there. The Day of the God. You know, so there are only a few works like that that give you that sense of cultural meeting. A lot of them more along the lines of this one, giving you a sense of um, harmonious, idealized world. The Day of the God, again, it's a religious scene with an idol figure, but it's not something he could have observed. It would have been something made up from imagination and memory and the study of old books. But this kind of uh, utopian idyll is very much uh, an influence on artists like Matisse later. Matisse actually did eventually make it to Tahiti himself, still today uh, a French colony. I'm sorry, this has got cropped a little, so the title here is Nevermore. Actually, in this case, the title written on is uh, in English. Again, it's a foreign language, remember, for his French um, audience, but still not Tahitian. Nevermore is a line from a Edgar Allan Poe poem about a raven, where well, we have a, a, a raven-like bird here. The raven is a sort of negative sort of symbol in the poem. So the theme is of the native girl f frightened uh, uh, in some way. Of course you can relate it to the whole theme of the reclining nude in Western art, but here's an exotic transposition of that. Very similar image uh, in a way, the spirit of the dead keeps watch. Again, a reclining figure of a native girl and the sort of negative presence, in this, in this case, the sort of spirit of the dead. And he, he sort of, he says this is uh, his um, painted after some specific in incident when his native partner uh, came home and she was very frightened because of, she felt at night time there were spirits were walking or something like that. one of the most complex of the images that he produces during this time. Has this very philosophical sounding title too. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? This is 1897. And it's actually just after completing this that he 
is contemplating suicide, com comes close to, to suicide. So you can even see, say it as a sort of suicide note, if you like, a kind of summing up of his life. Telling a whole s story from, really from birth to old age, if you like. The figure of the old woman with the hands to the side of her face bunched up but with the knees up. Um, it's, it's actually based on a Peruvian uh, mummified body, Very, actually quite a famous image of a Peruvian mummy uh, where the, the figure sort of has the limbs sort of bound up against the body. So he's looking back to his Peruvi Peruvian <coughs> beginnings in a way. There's an upward movement here, a sort of Eve-like figure picking the apple, then a sort of decline towards the end. The title is in French on, on the work itself. Gauguin says, um, you know, evaluating his own contribution to art. He says, the public owes me nothing since my pictorial work is only relatively good. But the painters who today are profiting from this freedom do owe me something. My work has little importance compared to its consequences, the freeing of painting from all restrictions. And I think that that's a fairly good estimation in a way of his in many ways his achievement is uh, the influence he has on other artists and how it enables their styles. Okay, let's, let's, let's take our break there and after the break we can look at the work of Cezanne, the third of the post-impressionist artists that we, we're considering.